happy to be here with you this morning with the students and friends and faculty and colleagues. When I was near your age, I had returned from serving as a missionary in Uruguay, and my wife and I were making plans for marriage. At that time, foreign language missions were for a period of two and a half years. I'd completed two years of college, but my memory was somewhat dulled by the passage of three years of time. I wanted then to be where you are now. So I came to BYU, and I talked to the chair of the Electrical Engineering Department. His first question was to ask me to invert a matrix. He gave me a piece of paper for my work. Now, we didn't study mathematics in our mission. <laughs> I had to confess to him that I'd forgotten how to do it. To this, he replied, then I suggest you go to the University of Utah. <laughs> and so that's how I got there. <laughs> that same question is not asked of students today, nor have I ever heard it asked of a prospective faculty member. The students today and the faculty possess remarkable talent. A recently faculty candidate on his visit here observed that the students all possessed five talents. Of course, he was referring to the parable of the talents found in Matthew chapter 25. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called, on, who called his servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability. It's an interesting phrase, to his several ability. And straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. To each of the first two the Lord said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. But unto the last servant he declared, I will take therefore the talent from you and give it unto, the, uh, unto him that, who hath ten talents. Many years ago, explorers discovered the remains of a Roman ship that sunk around the year 50 A.D. Inside, they found what they called copper blisters, or copper blister cakes. I brought one this morning, so you get an idea of what it is. Many of you thought I was too old to hold it up, and you're nearly right. These cakes were made of 99.2% pure copper, sufficiently pure to be used as an alloy, but not pure enough to be used for copper artifacts. So they required, if you're going to use them, additional manufacturing. In other words, these copper cakes had to be refined before they became useful. Because the discoverers could not see much value in these blister cakes, this particular one was discarded into the trash. A good friend of mine recovered it, and later one of our BYU scholars identified it as a talent. Now, part of it's been shaved off the top, and you can see that portion, but a talent refers to uh, a sum of money or to a weight. In the Old Testament, the amount of weight used for talent was about 75 pounds. Others indicate that this word changed about the time of the New Testament to refer to a sum of money, but still a large amount. Now, my point in showing you this talent today, getting a little out of breath here, but my point in showing you this talent is so that you'll understand that a talent is really large. You can't carry five talents. So when it said they gave a talent according to their several ability, they must have had family to help them carry it. In today's terms, a talent of gold, 75 pounds, might represent about a half a million dollars. Further, the talent represented here needs to go through the refiner's fire if it's to be used. Now, a BYU faculty member recently pointed out to me that this gives additional meaning to the parable of a king who forgave his servants a debt of 10,000 talents. It's a lot, of, a lot of these. And then demanded payment of a debt that was owed to him of just 100 pence or a dollar. Now, 10,000 talents would be, what, about $5 billion. 
catch my breath here. <laughs> what is expected then from you who are blessed with many talents? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, we read, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. President Hinckley, in his book Standing for Something, states, It is not enough just to live, just to survive. It is incumbent on each of us to equip ourselves to do something worthwhile in society, to acquire more and more light so that our personal light can help illuminate a darkened world. And this is made possible through learning, through educating ourselves, through progressing and growing in both mind and spirit. As I was growing up, my mother insisted that I read regularly. She would take me down to the public library and check out about a one-foot length of books from the library shelves. She typically chose biographies of great men and women. Sometimes it was painful to stay inside when I would rather be doing other things. But then each day I would see my mother reading and noted that she finished a book almost every day. That habit has stayed with her throughout her life and has blessed not only her children, but her grandchildren, extended family, former students, and friends. Today, at the age of 87, my mother has grown blind, but she still reads constantly. She now reads by listening to tapes of books, audio tapes. Just a few days ago, I asked her what book she had read recently. The list she gave me was impressive. She told me that she was rereading several of the classics, including the Iliad, the Odyssey, Dante's Divine Comedy, Moby Dick, Walden, and several others, all intermingled mingled with scripture and gospel study. She has made the quest for knowledge a lifetime pursuit. I would invite each of you to study and prepare your minds and then make a commitment to develop your talents to provide a significant contribution to the world. Look around you, and you will find the examples of many others who have made such a contribution. The university is filled with such people. A lot of them are here in this auditorium today. Talk to them. Find out what motivated them and inspired them. Then choose a pursuit that will bless mankind, your friends, and family. Much is expected of you. For unto everyone who hath other talents shall be given, and he shall have an abundance. But from him that hath not obtained other talents shall be taken away even that which he hath received. I would like to share with you some things that are important if you are to succeed in developing your talents. Prayer is perhaps one of the primary requirements in obtaining the guidance of our Heavenly Father. In this dispensation, one of the first lessons that we find taught in the Doctrine of Covenants concerns prayer and seeking divine guidance. Oliver Cowdery inquired of his Heavenly Father regarding the next steps in his life, and in response we are given an insight into the keys of asking and receiving answers to prayer. For asking, he was told, I say unto you that as assuredly as the Lord liveth, who is your God and Redeemer, even so surely shall you receive a knowledge of whatsoever things you shall ask in faith with an honest heart believing that you shall receive, and then the keys for receiving. I will tell you in your mind, so first in your mind, and in your heart by the Holy Ghost, which shall come upon you and dwell in your heart. You will all recall that Oliver failed in his attempts to translate because he did not understand two additional principles for acquiring knowledge. First, the requirement to study it out in our minds. And then we will either feel a burning in our bosoms if it is right, or a stupor of thought if it's wrong. Now, the answer to prayer does not always come quickly. Often answers come over long periods of time and in ways we do not anticipate. Some prayers may be answered immediately if we have the courage to ask them with an honest heart, faith, and believing that we shall receive. One such prayer is the one offered when we humbly and sincerely ask our Father in heaven what we need to repent of. The answer will come quickly, but it takes humility, courage, and resolve to utter this kind of prayer. Similarly, the Lord will ask your prayers about setting goals in your life and developing your talents. 
I have spoken with many students at BYU who have obtained such direction in their life. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Another important issue that you will face in your journey towards developing your talents is the choice of an eternal companion, colleagues, and friends. Of singular importance is the choice of an eternal companion. At one time, I regularly interviewed couples who had found that right one and were ready to be married. You are all likely familiar with the questions that are asked in these interviews, but to the set of prescribed topics, I added three questions. First, I asked each person how long it had taken them to know that their fiancé was the one. Most had earnestly prayed about their feelings towards their companion. Their answers startled me somewhat, but the responses were remarkably similar. The average time, they typically indicated, was about two and a half weeks from the time they started dating. I thought that was pretty, pretty quick. <laughs> then came my second question. How long did you wait before you expressed your feelings to your fiancé? Again, the responses were surprising. The average time to share their feeling from the time they first started dating was about six weeks. Now for the third question, I asked them about how long they had waited before they were going to get married. This time the answers varied greatly, but generally they chose the semester break closest to six months. <laughs> now I know that statisticians would say that my results may not be statistically significant and then only valid for the geographical area just to the south of campus. But I thought you might want to know how long some of your classmates are taking to get the answers to their prayers once they have found their eternal companion. Besides choosing the proper mate, seek out those who will lift you and inspire you to be better. Seek colleagues who know more than you and learn from them. Remember that in the parable of the talent, each servant was given, a ta given talents according to their several ability. Learn from the talents of others. Obedience is a key to progression, a key to faith, and a key to success. The search for truth and the, develop and the development of character. Just get a little bit of water here to help. And the development of character go hand in hand. Shakespeare said, To thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day, Thou canst not then be false to any man. Nephi tells us, I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded, for I know that the Lord giveth no commandments unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them that they may accomplish the thing which he commandeth them. Years ago, when I first came to BYU, I met a student from Korea. He had set lofty goals for himself, but he was rather poor and struggling to get through school but dedicated to the gospel. I suppose there are several of you in that same category today. He was determined that he was going to get an education and then return to bless his homeland. I worked with him and even went to his home to tutor him. He was a hard worker and was obedient in everything he was asked to do. Finally, after much effort, he graduated. His ultimate goal was to get his PhD, but circumstances did not permit. He worked in this local area for some time, and then I lost track of him. Recently, nearly 25 years later, one of my colleagues brought a visitor to my office and introduced him as the executive vice president of one of the largest electronic firms in Korea. I immediately recognized him, and all of our years of separation faded away. One of the blessings that can come <coughs> from being true to the gospel is the establishment of lasting and tender friendships. <sighs> As my former student and I talked, we found that our friendship had not changed. When one remains true to the gospel, our rendezvous with friends will be that way, as it was with Alma and the sons of Mosiah. Finally, I would like to counsel you to remember who you are spiritual sons and daughters of your Father in heaven. If you are true to this divine heritage, your Father will bless you. 
about three years ago, our college was scheduled for an inspection by our professional accreditation group. Accreditation is a critical step for a college since it provides a certification that the graduates of academic programs meet certain standards of knowledge and practice in fields of study. As part of our accreditation, documentation is prepared covering all aspects of study. Exams, homework, lecture outlines, and the like are assembled for the <coughs> scrutiny by the accreditation team. Students and faculty are interviewed and the facilities are inspected. Then just prior to their visit, the team leader of our accreditation group called and indicated that his team would be arriving at BYU on Sunday and wanted to spend that day inspecting laboratories and classrooms and in interviewing the department chairs and the senior faculty. Since I was dean, I responded that Sunday was the Sabbath day and that we would all be involved in worship. Further, I told him that the classrooms and laboratories were used by students for worship on that day, so it wouldn't be possible for him to visit. <laughs> he continued to press the issue and then let me know that the Sabbath day visit would be a requirement if we were to be accredited. Finally, an idea occurred to me. I responded that we would accommodate their visit if they would come in the middle of the day. I was sure that there would be a sacrament meeting in progress in the study area of the Clyde Building, and that there would be ongoing classes in the auditorium, classrooms, and laboratories. When the time for our visit arrived, our department chairs all presented themselves in their Sunday best. The accreditation team arrived in casual attire and were startled to see that all the young men had on white shirts and ties, <laughs> and that all of the young women were wearing dresses. They also noticed that all of the students were better, better dressed than their team members. Our department chairs introduced themselves and we split up to visit different areas of the college. I took the team leader to the doorway that enters the study area in the Clyde Building. He stopped suddenly and peered through the door to see a young man giving a talk in sacrament meeting. He wouldn't go in, but listened intently for a while. Then he turned to me and observed that these students were worshiping. <laughs> Somehow I wasn't surprised, <laughs> but that he had rather expected that their worship would be in the form of sitting around tables and drinking Coke. He then asked to go to one of our large classrooms. I escorted him to the rear entrance of the auditorium in the Clyde Building and entered the room from the rear doors. There we observed a young lady who was standing by the side of a table, covered with a tablecloth <laughs> that had a flower on it. She was given a Relief Society lesson, and I explained the role of the Relief Society in the church. The next stop was similar, but we saw an elders quorum at this time. As we were leaving, I took the opportunity to tell him about the Sunday School program. The other visitors from the accreditation team each had the same experience. Then, two days later, the team met with the academic vice president of Brigham Young University for a brief oral report on the state of our college. His opening statement surprised us, for he pointed out that it was clear our students and education were firmly grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is not something you generally hear from a professional group. Then the team members, one by one, were most laudatory in their reviews of both the academic programs and the students. Remember who you are. In 2002, a consortium of companies, including General Motors, EDS, Unigraphics, and Sun, made a software donation to BYU that amounted to over $300 million. This donation provided we were, was provided, we were told, to acknowledge the accomplishments of the students and faculty and to help them with their academic programs. We scheduled a time for the presentation that allowed us to focus on this generous gift. I am grateful to all of those students who came and supported us in such grand fashion, and the PACE group was all abuzz about their visit and the celebration. Everything was perfect about that day. 
Then, Pace decided to make a similar donation to BYU-Idaho. This donation was somewhat smaller and amounted to about $60 million in software. Unlike BYU, BYU-Idaho scheduled their announcement to coincide with their weekly devotional. Just prior to the time of the devotional, President Bednar had a reception for the Pace team. During that time, he talked about BYU-Idaho, their unique approach to sports, and the devotional that they held regularly. He explained that it was a custom at BYU-Idaho, and I haven't been there except for this one time uh, during a devotional, but it was a custom for the students to hold up their scriptures at the beginning of the devotional to show that they all had them. Then he presented a copy of the scriptures to the PACE team leader so that he wouldn't be embarrassed when the students all had their scriptures. <laughs> During the devotional, President Bednar called upon the PACE team leader also to say a few words, which he gave most appropriately. Again last year, the same PACE team leader asked me to attend an annual conference in New York. I went and made a presentation concerning what BYU had done with our PACE gift to the other deans in attendance. After I finished, the PACE leader related to the entire group of deans that he had a copy of the scriptures that he had received from BYU-Idaho. He told how he valued these and recounted his wonderful experience there. Remembering who we are can have a lasting effect for good. At BYU not long ago, a young man approached his bishop to introduce himself. You probably have gone through a similar thing at the beginning of the semester. He was for the Pacific Rim and stated that his given name was Golden. Proudly, he told his bishop that his parents were converts to the Church and they had named him in honor of the General Authority who spoke at a conference and had such an impact upon them when they were investigating the gospel. He told how his parents wanted him to always remember the great example set by that man. As I heard this, I was a little surprised, golden, and my thoughts were likely the same as yours. <laughs> then his bishop went on to tell, then he went on to tell his bishop, the name of that general authority was Golden B. Hinckley. <laughs> that name has served to him as a tender reminder both of what his parents expected of him and of his parents' humble origins. I would like to close with the invitation that President Hinckley gave to the women of the Church and extend that same, women, same invitation to you today. I would invite you to rise to the great potential within you. I do not ask that you reach beyond your capacity. I hope you will not nag yourselves with thoughts of failure. I hope you will not try to set goals far beyond your capacity to achieve. I hope you will simply do what you can do in the best way you know how. If you do so, you will witness miracles come to pass. I share these thoughts with you and leave my testimony that I know the Church is true. I wish you the best of blessings as you seek to develop your talents. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>